next in universal jurisdiction. Thank you so much to the foundation for having invited me to be here. I also, well, I would like to highlight two mistakes that you made. Well, once, uh, first one, you invited me to come here. Second, you invited me to take part in the round table. I have nothing to say. But as a good advocate of human rights, whenever I'm giving a microphone, I will use, I will take advantage of the microphone. So the topic that I suggested was well, trying to map, trying to map the key players and the bottlenecks in universal jurisdiction so that we understand what happens and what is the role played by universal jurisdiction in terms of integrating it within the political, social and uh, legal security and to promote the or ensure the respect of human rights. Well, the only conclusion that I would like you to take home is that the exercise of universal justice is strongly depends on the social and political context. We cannot really analyze universal jurisdiction from an abstract uh, setting. Well, this morning we heard about compare or comparison between different experiences. And for that, I think it is interesting to start identifying six key actors in universal jurisdiction. The first one that it was mentioned, that has been mentioned several times, are victims. Victims that request or demand the exercise or so application of human rights. And here, I think two clarifications should be made. So we are not talking about any victims that have victims of violation of human rights. They are victims of crimes against the humanity. And second, in this definition of victims, we should well, we should look at it from a broad viewpoint. Who is considered a victim according to Article 24 in terms of enforced disappearances is not only those that disappear, but those who were damaged as a consequence of that first disappearance. The second element is about the victims. It's about where are these victims? Where the crime was committed or in the place or in the country where the universal jurisdiction is accepted, or rather they are in a third country. And what are the real possibilities for them to participate in the processes of universal jurisdiction and justice? And then, well, the examples that were mentioned today here show that the level of participation of victims changes from, varies from case to case. And I'm not, well, we don't find like a strong involvement or engagement in all the cases. And I believe that this is highly limiting in terms of of the impact that universal justice may have in some cases. And it is, I think it is essential to take into account that victims could have different perspectives or views in terms of the exercise of universal justice. And of course, that has to be taken into account. And they may also have legal or political strategies, depending whether they are living in the countries where the international crimes were committed or in the crime in the a country where the crimes are being prosecuted. So we should take into account the perspective of the victims. Therefore, this will help us take into account the multiple approaches that these victims may have. And it is also essential, and we have seen that in successful cases, it is essential to ensure ample participation of victims, access to courts, access to uh, those who are investigating international crimes, and then analyzing the uh, procedural system of the country and to see whether they could participate uh, directly and to ask for requests and, uh, and demand things from 
judges. Well, this morning, in this morning round table, we lots was said about the perspective of the litigating lawyers, as well as the organizations taking part in these litigations. That is to say, civil society organizations. And here we could differentiate three types of organizations organization of uh, relatives of victims, organization of human rights, and then we should also take, see where if these organizations, uh, where are they located, where the crime was committed, where, where the crime is being prosecuted, or if they are in third countries. And we should also analyze the strategies used by each of them. In many cases, we've seen that, when many cases of universal jurisdiction, we've seen that there is not sufficiently accepted coordination between the different organizations in the countries where universal jurisdiction is being executed and the country where the crimes were committed. And that is limiting. That is limiting on the uh, impact of universal jurisdiction. With this, I mean access to evidence, access to witnesses. And I believe that the lessons that we have learned over the past 20 years has led us to that now when we start a case of universal jurisdiction, we are more and more aware of the need to have full articulation between the different organizations, both uh, of victims, of or relatives of victims, and human rights association. And the third element, and this is no surprise to any of you, the third key player is the one that represents the uh, well, the judicial power. And here, I mean the judges. Well, judges cannot be uh, looked at in a univocal manner, in a equivocal manner. So we see different experiences in different countries where there is a difference between the investigating magistrate and the judges in Supreme Court. And that, well, some of them may open up the doors more to universal jurisdictions, others may close doors more to universal jurisdiction. Here we need to analyze the impartiality of the courts, where the crimes will be prosecuted, where the crimes have been committed, and what type of due process is guaranteed. And mainly the capacity for for investing for investigating this type of international crimes. We've seen that the judicial power to have the capacity to interpret and to enforce international law that, that is the basis of universal jurisdiction. It is also extremely important to see if the judicial power, and when I say the judicial power, I'm including the public prosecutors also, whether they have the technical cap capability to investigate these type of cases. For instance, linguistic limitations that they may face when it comes to investigating these cases, whether they have enough uh, financial and human resources support in order to carry out their investigations, and whether they have a generic capacity to investigate breaches of human rights. Well, there is a difference between the ju judiciary in Argentina investigating these type of cases after the whole experience, 20 years of experience that we have in this type of cases, complex cases of breaches of human rights versus a tribunal in Belgium that have never faced a human rights case and then out of sudden they have to face these complex cases of international crimes. So we have to recover and learn from the experience that uh, has been achieved by some courts in some countries for this type of cases. And obviously, there are many other complexities uh, that judges and prosecutors face. Are international crimes considered uh, crimes in internal law? What about prescription? Is the prescription? A possibility for the crimes to prescribe or not? What about the immunity of uh, foreign 
top officials. Prosecutors, what is the degree of discretionary to exert penal procedures or penal a criminal action? So we've seen that in the most successful cases of universal jurisdiction are found in situations where there are teams, teams of experts in terms of universal jurisdiction. And also, in the case of Spain and its relationship with Argentina has uh, proven, but also the case of uh, Spain with regard to the Pinochet case. Well, judicial cooperation is essential. It is essential to move forward, to make progress, uh, to consolidate universal jurisdiction. And of course, in the case of the judiciary, we really want to see who are the judges that are promoting universal jurisdiction, on which countries and on which countries the universal jurisdiction is not being promoted and what are the kind of pressures that these judges may uh, receive or feel uh, or receive if they promote universal jurisdiction on some countries. I also would like to stress the role of legislative power. First of all, as the resonance box of the political debate that is ongoing in democratic societies. We've seen that the past, past week, the Guatemala uh, parliament well, Guatemala was asked to investigate uh, many well massacres uh, qualified as slaughtering. So, on the one hand, the legislative power uh, explains or, or shows the political debate generated from universal jurisdiction. And also the legislative power has an essential role in terms of opening up the doors for universal jurisdiction. We should not forget that it, it is the parliament of countries that establish the universal um, justice that allows the, for the uh, application of universal jurisdiction. But it also has the possibility to, to enforce it. So we see that in Spain, Parliament allows universal jurisdiction, but at the same time puts a limit to universal jurisdiction whenever sees some of the repercussions from that. But the Parliament also uh, states or classifies uh, crimes as international crimes, ratifies some treaties allowing for universal jurisdiction, but at the same time it also has the powers to limit the scope of the obligations regarding universal jurisdiction. And the fourth, the fourth uh, power is the, the fourth key player is the executive uh, power. We have to see what is the role played in the country where the uh, universal jurisdiction is being enforced and what are the possibilities and the attitudes of all the stakeholders. In general, executive powers in the countries where universal jurisdiction is being enforced sometimes feel inconvenient because the executive power feels the pressure from third countries to limit the exercise or the enforcement of universal jurisdiction. And then this, more often than not, is the cause for many tensions. However, we still can see how that many, that some countries are enforcing universal jurisdiction and some of the actors of executive, in the executive power play an essential role. For instance, in Argentina, well, we have the, well, the diplomatic body is at the service of uh, enforcing universal jurisdiction in Argentina, whereas the situation is the opposite in other countries. Sometimes the diplomatic body blocks this type of uh, universal jurisdiction. We have all heard cases in this regard. However, there are other authorities within the executive power that can also play an essential role. Many countries where universal jurisdiction was enforced 
started from the attitude, as a result of the attitude of immigration authorities. Whenever a person emigrates to a country and there is suspicion that this person has committed an international crime, some countries force their immigration authorities to uh, report those cases. Or so, and actually, also very important is the attitude of executive powers in third countries. That is to say, countries that are not directly involved in a case in cases of universal jurisdiction. And luckily enough, we could say that most of these countries with these executive powers have acted with indifference. However, other countries have acted uh, uh, acted uh, actively. Notice, for instance, Pinochet case. When it was initiated here in Spain, the first country, well, Henry Kissinger was the first one to write an editorial criticizing universal jurisdiction. Well, perhaps he was not that isolated from the case. He participated directly in the coup in 1973. However, we have a proactiveness uh, or proactivity in terms of blocking, of blocking enforcement of universal jurisdiction. So therefore, nowadays at a time where we are all concerned about the limitations on universal jurisdiction here in Spain, actually these limitations should have started 15 or 18 years ago when universal jurisdiction started to be enforced here in Spain and where most of the international community manifested itself with absolute indifference, if not fully against the enforcement of universal jurisdiction. So today, focusing only in this step back in Spain is a mistake because this step back comes from is the result of the international community leaving Spain alone after making so much progress. And also the last key player is what I refer to as international community, if something like that exists. And outside or beyond the countries that I mentioned, I think there are two key players to be taken into account. First of all, the ICC and its and the courts that enforce universal jurisdiction. I'm not going to go into details, but well, these are relationships that have to be established and fixed and defined over the next few years. And also the second important actor that impacts, that has an impact on universal jurisdiction that could help it or hinder it is the international courts or international commissions for human rights. The European Tribunal, the ECHR, there will be a talk about it yesterday, has affirmed that European courts have the competency to implement, to enforce judicial universal jurisdiction. They also agree with the fact that France does not uh, apply the law on, on amnesty. But also recently, in January 2014, authorizes immunity in a case of uh, alleged torture uh, brought against uh, some military people in the UK. So therefore, they have allowed for, well, the, for immunity. Well, we still haven't found cases in Latin America in this regard. However, they have defined their obligation to prosecute this type of cases. So therefore, in two cases, the Calcutta against Peru and against Paraguay, well, the court was very clear when it said that states have the obligation to extradite people to Peru in one case, uh, Fujimori, and in the case of Goiburu, some agents, some Paraguayan 
Agents who were living in Brazil, there is an obligation to cooperate when justice, when international crimes are being investigated. So this is a very brief mapping of some of the institutional actors that take place in the process of universal jurisdiction that may help or hinder the processes of social, political, and legal security creation processes, both in the states that are in for universal jurisdiction and in the states where international. If you want. Ariel, as president of the task force, he works, he writes down as Isaiah Berlin. I, I, I don't understand this. There was this friend of Isaiah Berlin who said, I've read your letter, and Isaiah asked, did you understand everything? And he said, 70%. And Isaiah's response, well, you have the record. Nobody had understood that much of my handwriting before. And that you can read in Mike Nenadev's biography. The task force on enforced disappearances at the UN, what's your opinion about it? What's your opinion about current situation of victims of uh, crimes under Franco's regime and the relentless search for quest for justice? Briefly, since we are short on time, first, social effect. I think there is social impact and and. Taking into account our own countries and historical circumstances, there is a social um, effect. First, you start enforcing universal jurisdiction, and then you have a claim from the victims of the crimes under Franco's regime. I think this is an example of universal jurisdiction, where it starts, and then investigation of international crimes, which connected to the question that I did he ask me? I think that thanks to Spanish justice, there is an impunity pattern during the crimes under Franco's regime. No one's been punished or convicted for those crimes. So, either Spanish justice does not have the jurisdiction, the competences, or is not willing to pursue and prosecute those crimes committed and those, uh, during the civil war and the dictator.